<laughs> no, it's okay. Everything's Are you good. Ronnie? Are we on tape? Video. Yep, we're going. <laughs> On? Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, our topic for ROP is Russian colonization. Um, in my portion of the presentation, I'll be highlighting the historical realities of the war which dominates the background setting of our book, uh, Lermontov's A Hero of Our Time. This war is the Caucasian War. Uh, the incredibly long time period of this brutal war of Russian imperial aggression qualifies it as a war of attrition. This term defines the Caucasian War as one that drags on for long periods of time, with few significant gains for either side. <coughs> Victories eventually reached by wearing down the enemy through brutality and isolation. Uh, so where exactly is this ethno-linguistic region known as Circassia located in relation to today's geopolitical landscape? Um, Circassia is this uh, area outlined in red, which is over here on this a kind of very far eastern area of Europe. Um, it's located on uh, the Caucasian Mountains, hence the term Caucasian War. Um, and it's kind of on the border of Georgia and Azerbaijan uh, with modern day Russia. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. All right. Um, uh, the war is the foundation of Russian offensives on this region to even this day. But why do they want this land in the first place? Is it really worth the trouble of uh, this off and on fighting that's gone on for more than a century? Uh, there are many answers to this question, but in the time period of our book, the foremost goal was to gain Black Sea ports to take advantage of uh, the Ottoman climb. The Ottoman Turkish Empire at this time is declining, and by uh, taking ports on the Black Sea, the Tsar hoped to expand Russia through Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey and through Persia, even to India to challenge the English and French uh, in, this, in South Asia. Uh, these ports would be crucial to his long-term strategy. Uh, today, the region is desired mostly for its vast mineral wealth, uh, especially in oil and natural gas. Uh, Russia desires this resource uh, so that it can kind of control Europe and uh, kind of dangle that above the heads of Europe to, to kind of make it, uh, make it kind of do its will. Um, this area is also, um, this also a key crossroads in trade. This is the place where Persian oil, so oil from Iran and Azerbaijan and this entire region, that's, this is where that oil is taken to be distributed to the rest of the world, in those same Black Sea ports that they once fought over. Um, so today, pipelines crisscross the area, and it would be especially useful if ever there were to be war breaking out in uh, Arabia, in the Strait of Hormuz, as, as, as could potentially happen in that volatile region. This would be kind of the back door, and just as it was in the time of, of our story. Uh, so why is it so hard for Russia to win over Circassia? Why are they still fighting even to this day? Um, Circassia would prove nearly impossible for the Russians to permanently defeat. This is due not only to its mountainous, rugged, and remote landscape, but also to just how different Imperial Russia and Circassia really are. To illustrate this, I've composed this diagram uh, with each nation represented by its respective flag. Um, you, see on, you can see on the top here with Circassia's flag, um, it was kind of, at the time of, of this war, it was kind of an, a, a band of independent tribes that kind of formed together to, uh, as a group, fight off the Russian imperial aggression. Uh, so they're, they're complete opposites, really, in, in the way that they live and their worldviews. Um, the Circassians are tribal. It's, it's a group of about ten different tribes. Uh, they're Muslim. Uh, they were converted uh, by the Ottoman Turks. And also, their economy uh, is, is heavily dependent on subsistence farming. They aren't really a, a modernized, industrialized people, and even to this day, they're, it's not a very industrialized region. It's really, uh, the people are just kind of there farming to support themselves and not much else. Um, on the other hand, Russia, uh, at the time, uh, and still is heavily Christian, uh, dominated by the Russian Orthodox faith. Uh, kind of a key tenet of the Russian cultural identity. Uh, it's imperial. Their government is completely the opposite of these small, isolated tribes 
it is it is a, a czarist empire with a with a king a czar a Caesar at the helm uh, of, of a vast empire with very strict hierarchy uh, delineating power across uh, this vast territory and it's also very industrialized so uh, their worldview and what they see as productive is completely different from how the Circassians would view what is what is a successful economy. Um, these problems continue to provide difficulties to this very day, uh, with Muslim minorities seeking self-determination to forge their own destiny as independent nations, with continued harsh Russian responses to maintain a tight grip on any mineral wealth, particularly in places like Chechnya, where uh, insurgents struggle for freedom uh, for, in the name of radical Islam, but <coughs> Russia continues to respond uh, very harshly because, well, Chechnya happens to uh, be home to a lot of oil, and uh, Russia, as they did in that time, and they continue to do today, they've decided that those resources uh, that this region offers is more important than the rights or the livelihood of the people who live there, in short. Uh, that's why this issue remains so relevant even now. That's because today's issues are directly related to the themes of exploitation and oppression seen in our book. Wars continue to rage here with Russia continuing the pursuit of mineral wealth through brutal war. Um, and one that directly relates to and is fairly recent is the South Ossetian War. Ossetia is a, a region in, in the borderlands between Georgia and Russia. And just a couple of years ago, in 2008, um, a region called South Ossetia, so Ossetia is divided between North and South, North Ossetia being a part of uh, Russia, South Ossetia being a part of Georgia, and South Ossetia was looking to uh, join Northern Ossetia to become a, a, its own independent uh, state. However, uh, the Russians kind of saw this as an opportunity. Uh, they decided they would help this liberation of the Ossetian people. But really, it was only kind of a, a ploy just so they could then take advantage of, of the resources offered by the region. Uh, of course, they ended up losing this region, and uh, South Ossetia remains a part of Georgia, but this just illustrates how ongoing this struggle really is. All right, and now I'm <coughs> going to uh, connect this back to our book a little bit here. Uh, this violent history is exactly why this is the perfect place for romantic hero. Romanticism is based upon the living of dramatic lives based on principle and a connection to one's emotion and the natural world. This theme is perfect, then, for the beautiful Caucasus, uh, where compassion for the <laughs> exploited tribes pulls at the heartstrings of any great romantic. Byron himself, the father of romanticism, died in the Greek Revolution, helping a foreign people determine their own fate. So, too, with the heroes of Pushkin and Tolstoy, contrasted by the great Byronic anti-hero, Pekarin of uh, Lermontov's finest work, The Hero of Our Time. All right, now I'm going to have a couple of discussion questions. Hopefully you guys have some thoughts. Um, uh, do you think uh, that the Circassians are justified in their results? Uh, if, you were, if you were a person uh, living in this area at the time, how would you feel? Would you see this as the Russians trying to modernize them? Or do you have a thought earlier? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the um, Native American colonization, um, kind of conquest when the settlers came to America, and I feel like they probably are justified in their revolts because it is their land, but when you talk about like social Darwinism, they probably aren't going to win, so it's kind of like both. So it's kind of inevitable. Um, would you have taken up arms like Byron to fight for these people if, if you were in a position to do so at that time period? Anyone feel that strongly? No? I mean, it is. It, it's just it's social Darwinism, and I kind of feel that way too, that it, this is just kind of history running its course, that eventually certain peoples are just, uh, they're inherently stronger, and, and they're going to use their national identities, uh, just this is kind of that German thought that certain groups will just win out, and that's kind of how it goes. Um, and that's kind of what history has shown us. Now, hopefully there is a place for these minorities, because they have a, a very, it's a, it's a beautiful and interesting culture that you don't find anywhere else in the world. Um, but eventually, it, it, all things kind of become the same. Uh, do you guys sympathize with Pekarin then uh, in his conquest of the uncivilized minorities, like to a point? 
I mean, do you see it as what he's doing is kind of a gift to these people? Because that's, I think that's how the Russians saw it. At least that's what they convinced themselves, is that it was kind of, they were helping the Russians. I mean, it might be a gift, like, in a way, because they're becoming more modern, and they're kind of adjusting to a civilized world, but they might not want it. They might not want to be civilized, so I don't know. All right, um, now I think Connor is going to take over and tell you guys some more details about the Russian military. All right, so I'm going to talk about, about the Russian military, like the actual structure and stuff, and the way it was <coughs> at the time of the hero of our time. Um, here's some just background in information. The Russian army was called the Imperial Russian Army at the time period. And then until the time of military reform in the 18 in uh, 1874, the Russian army had no barracks. They just like almost half a million soldiers were deployed in primitive dugouts and huts or private homes. And you see that in the novel itself when like um, they, have, they they have to stop at home sometimes to stay there the nights when they're like traveling through the mountains and stuff. And here's some pictures I found on the internet, Russian army. <laughs> you can study them, they're pretty interesting. Yeah, guns. <laughs> and then, um, Russian army ranks. And then there are 14 uh, grades. Grades 1 through f or 4 are for generals, and grades 4 through 8 are for staff captains. And officers have grades between um, 9 and 14. And under officers and privates are not special enough to be given grades, which is pretty sad for them. <laughs> Um, mili mil military characters in the novel, so, I, so I'm just going to run through like the four major military characters <coughs> in the novel and say what grades they probably had, and then ask a discussion <coughs> question about them. And then, Pecorian is said to be an officer, a young man, about 25 years, so most likely he was a grade 12 lieutenant officer. And do you think that Pecorian has an interest in the army, or moving up rank, or did he join it just to kind of do something? I think he may have tried just because he got bored easily with everything, so he just tried a little bit of all parts of life. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't see it much of a motivation in Pecorin to move up in the army or really to be, because he said that he was not bored of guns and shooting and stuff. That even that ended up boring him. Mrs. Craft. This is more of a question for you. Did, um, did one's financial <coughs> economic level affects their grade? I have an answer to that. Um, it, actually, in, in this new reformed kind of czarist Russia, um, there was no more kind of noble system. They, they had gotten rid of the feudal system as it existed before. A military rank wasn't based as it had been before on just your family name or because your, your uncle was, was a duke or whatever. Um, now, uh, your status in nobility is completely based upon your service to the military. So, uh, the more you serve your country through the military, the more the Tsar will move you up. So really, it's the first time in Russian society that there's a chance for social mobility. And that's kind of why a lot of people see this as, you know, that this is their chance to move up in the world, is through military rank. And then, uh Maxim Maximich is repeatedly said to be a staff captain, and a staff captain is great is a grade ten officer, and then he outranks Pekarin. But 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 my question is, although he outranks, uh, <coughs> why do you think that he looks so much up to him? He like always tries he always tries to be like, like be near him, and easily hurt and stuff when uh, Pechorin barely acknowledges him later. How are you? Um, I think he um, kind of like. <coughs> I think he probably wishes he could have been like Pekrin and maybe when he was younger. And um, he's, there's something about Pekrin's personality that just, just like draws people to him because he's so confident. And I think Maximich like sees that and maybe because he's in the military, I think he almost like confidence is like a virtue. 